Britain has an epic history, but within it, there's a wealth of untold secrets still to uncover. It's a really key find, find of the week. So every year, hundreds of archaeologists set out hunting for clues to solve the mystery of who we are and where we've come from. We've just found this amazing pendant. Over the past year, their discoveries have been more exciting than ever. This series will explore the best of them. I've just found a coin. Oh, marvellous. Brought to you from the field in a very special way. Each excavation has been filmed for us as it happened by the archaeologists themselves. It looks absolutely fantastic. So he had a bad day when he never brought these back. Their dig diaries mean that we can be there for every crucial moment of discovery. Oh, wow! Oh! Do we have a winner here? No, I think it's stunning. Incredible. Our archaeologists will be joining us here in our special lab to take a closer look at their finds and to figure out what they really mean. This is so exciting. Welcome to Digging for Britain. In this programme, we're joining teams of archaeologists across the east of Britain to share in their biggest new finds. We're there for the grim discovery at a crossrail site that reveals the brutality of Roman rule in Britain. If they show signs of injury, then these are beheading victims. We dive deep in the Thames, searching for clues to explain a mysterious naval tragedy. It was really amazing, actually, that that's been under the water for 350 years. And we explore a British story in Belgium as a team reveals the secret advantage that helped Wellington snatch victory at Waterloo. What you have here is basically a hollow ball packed with gunpowder. To understand how these discoveries and more fit into the story of Britain, archaeologist Matt Williams and I have been given special access to the Museum of London. Its unique collection tells the story of the East from this area's earliest inhabitants. So these are people beginning to settle in the landscape around London. The first Londoners. And we'll get to see parts of the museum the public rarely get access to. There are 20,000 skeletons down here. Our first dig diary is not from Britain, it's from Belgium. But it explores a very British story, Wellington's victory at Waterloo. In 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte faced the Duke of Wellington and his European allies at Waterloo. Wellington's victory ended Napoleon's rule and settled the fate of modern Europe. 200 years later, an international team of archaeologists travelled to Waterloo to excavate the battlefield for the first time, hoping to understand how one farmyard had become pivotal to the outcome of the battle and how the Allied army successfully defended that farmyard against the odds. According to Wellington, Waterloo was the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. We know that his victory hinged on finding a way to get ammunition to his outnumbered troops stationed here at Hugomont Farm. But we don't have proof for how he did it. Now, archaeologists from Waterloo Uncovered are searching for clues and for evidence of the French onslaught fought off by Wellington's men. We've been working down in the stubble field for the past three days, and that was an area that at the time of the battle was occupied by a wood. The French did advance up through that wood, and that fight within the wood is not fully understood. There are some eyewitness accounts, but it's, it's fairly vague. We know Wellington's men occupied the farm, and now, for the first time, we can understand how fiercely they had to defend it, as the team's investigations reveal the intensity of Napoleon's opening attack. This tree faces onto an open area where we know there was a lot of fighting 
that have been shooting coming from the wall over there, 40 yards away. Um, so either way, these trees are going to be right on the backstop for any, any sort of musketry that's going on around here. And of course, at chest height, balls that have hit trees are going to be fired at human beings who are milling around these trees. It's pretty, pretty remarkable that yeah. 200 years later it's all still here. Mm -hmm. Wellington had 1,200 men defending Hugomont. It's believed that Napoleon sent 4,000 to take it. And now metal detecting is revealing definitive proof of that savage assault by the French. By the wall, picking up multiple targets. They look like French musket balls, um, all concentrated within a, probably a foot square. I've picked up four. One of them, if you can see, if I don't drop it, is embedded. It's still got brick dust on it. The shot struck the southern wall, which the records say was where Napoleon ordered his attack to begin. Now inside the farm, the team uncover great quantities of French musket balls, which reveal how desperately Napoleon's army fought to get in. Further in, we're looking at musket shot that has been fired at close range. It's impacted. So what it looks like we've got here is French making it at least to the top of the wall and firing down into the enclosure, possibly also through the loopholes, all of which is going to be defended. So I think what we've got is a picture of a very, very brutal fight on the wall top, much more so than, than the accounts that in some cases lead us to believe. Records tell us that the British defence of the southern wall held firm. While on the north side of the farm, more French troops desperately attacked the heavy gates of the farmyard. It's a pretty formidable target once it's closed, but you have to close the gates first, and that's where the whole battle could have turned. Now we're op opening the gates. Check now, Frenchman. Okay. The gates had been left open. 30 French soldiers seized their chance and burst through. If reinforcements managed to join them, a British massacre and a French victory at Waterloo would have been inevitable. An absolute desperate fight, and the men who came to close this gate left that fight going on behind them, turned their backs on it, and pushed the gate closed against this great press of Frenchmen who had seized the advantage and were trying to get in. Um, so, a pretty key moment in the battle. According to the history books, Wellington's Coldstream Guards forced the gates closed and saved their army from disaster. But on day seven, the team finds possible evidence to show that Napoleon only intensified his efforts to seize the farm. What you have here is basically a hollow ball packed with gunpowder. It was fired by the French from the ridge behind the complex. That fire happened in the afternoon of the battle and the idea was basically to burn down the buildings. And they succeeded in that, these explosive shells set fire to the chateau, the house, which burned to the ground, and the various outbuildings were burned as well. And so from this, on the face of it, fairly unexciting lump of rust, we've added another piece to the jigsaw that is the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon followed this barrage with an attack on the blazing farm by another five and a half thousand men. But Wellington could only call upon an extra 800, leaving him in a precarious position. To hold the farm, he needed to keep his outnumbered troops supplied with ammunition. And a trench dug in a sunken road at the back of the farm may reveal for the first time how he did it. I think that is the 1815 surface. What makes you think it's 1815? The pottery and the queen that came out. The artefacts from the bottom of this trench date to the year of the battle, showing that 200 years ago, the road's surface was several feet lower than it is today. But I think that that would have provided the Allies with crucial cover from the French. And the team also think that this sunken road gave Wellington hidden access to the farm to get his supply wagons in without the French noticing. If you've actually got quite an enclosed hedge line and you've got literally a, almost a tunnel then that would have given him so much better cover. And although it was still air feet to get a horse and wagon down here under French attack and then to get it across to the gate and into Hugmont Farm, it does actually, to me, 
give me a better picture of what that the, the surroundings <coughs> must have been like. This dig may have finally revealed Wellington's secret advantage, a hidden road that enabled him to keep his troops armed, to defend Hugomont Farm, defeat Napoleon, and win the Battle of Waterloo. To explain more about how the battle was fought and its grim aftermath, the dig team have brought some of their finds into our lab. So, Charlie, how important was Hugomont Farm and the battle here in the, in the context of Waterloo more generally? Certainly for Wellington's army, it was very important. Um, the yeah. French are in blue the and the British are in red. red. Um, and Hugomont here stands, together with the wood to the south uh, and the orchard, um, in front of this ridge, guarding Wellington's right flank. Had the French got through at Hugomont and seized control of that, they would have been able to secure um, potentially a, a battle-winning advantage. I think we always tend to think, or at least I always tend to think, of Waterloo being a battle of the British against the French, but Dominique, there were other people there as well. Oh yeah, there's a lot of other nations involved in the conflict, and you have um, Hanoverians, Anglo-Dutch, Brunswick, Belgo-Dutch, and of course the Prussians. They played a, an essential role in the English victory. We've got some of the finds here. Dominique, can you tell me what that is? Well, I can tell you that it's a French musket ball because it's smaller than the English one, as you can see very clearly. Mm -hmm. I think we've uncovered why uh, there was an Allied victory and they simply had <laughs> yeah, bigger yeah. musket balls. <laughs> and the fact that the French one are smaller than the English one means that the English can reuse French musket balls, which is not the case. On the contrary. Uh, so the English <laughs> could fit the smaller bullets yeah, back into yeah. it, the smaller musket balls back into your own so rifle. That is a significant advantage. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So the documentary sources, the eyewitness accounts, and the archaeological finds, they do agree on one thing. This was a brutal battle. Do we have any idea what the total human cost actually was? Yeah, probably around 12,000 killed. And you have to add to that the wounded and the disappeared, so around 50,000 people. And what happened to all the bodies then? Most of the armies would have moved on by the time we get around to burying the dead. So we're talking about the local people, the farmers, the peasants, the people who lived on the land, trying to get rid of these bodies that would be stinking, causing a great mess and getting in the way of agriculture. So they tipped into a grave and got rid of. Anything that uh, is useful, and can be used, can be sold, will be stripped from them and the bodies will be disposed of as quickly as possible. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. Scavenging among the dead for valuables was grim enough, but around the time of the Battle of Waterloo, this common practice took an altogether darker turn. I've come to see the evidence for myself right in the depths of the Museum of London. Well, this is the Museum of London's bone store and every one of these boxes contains at least one human skeleton. In total, there are 20,000 skeletons down here. Amongst them is remarkable evidence of a macabre but lucrative trade, one made possible by the vanity of London's rich and the huge death rates at battles like Waterloo. So this is an incredible bit of dental work that's been carried out. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this is remarkable. So this is the, the mandible, the lower jaw of a female, and she was buried at St Marilyn Church, and we know her name because she had a coffin plate, and that survived in enough detail for us to be able to read what her name was. So she's Mrs Charlotte Bampton Taylor, and we know that she died in 1837 and was 77 years old. And to be buried where she was would indicate she had money, she was high status, and looking at this that you can see here, which is a rather remarkable piece of dentistry, is that, a, is that a real tooth that's, that's there? I it, mean, this is a, it's, yes. a, it's a false tooth in her mouth. But, yes. But it looks like a real human tooth. Yeah, it does. It's fantastic. So it is a real human tooth from somebody else, and it's been put into an ivory plug 
to fit it in and then to actually stabilize it within her own mouth and around the teeth is this metal wire that's been wrapped around and that uh, from tests has come back as being platinum so very expensive it's an extraordinary piece of 200 year old dentistry but more extraordinary still is where the tooth itself may have come from when we see this sort of form of dentistry, we have a term that we relate to as Waterloo teeth. Related to the Battle of Waterloo? Yes, and that's because we know that, unfortunately, when these men were involved in these battles and somewhere such as Waterloo, you've got very high death rates, you've got lots of people that are dying. You then have an opportunity to actually claim something to make money, and that would be the teeth teeth were very lucrative so people would actually then go around extracting the teeth to then sell and use in other people's mouths it's Very extraordinary so you've got this well-heeled woman she's lost quite a few teeth yes actually, but she's yes. lost this tooth right in the front which does <coughs> affect her appearance and she's paid to have this expensive dental work done so that she can smile at somebody with a dead man's tooth in <laughs> her mouth yes stories like these are why I love archaeology it has the power to shock us with grim revelations like this about what London's rich did in the name of vanity. And it can surprise us too with new insights into an iconic battle that defined Britain and Europe for centuries. But few of archaeology's surprises come as unexpectedly as in our next dig diary. It comes from Lenborough in Buckinghamshire, where one amateur made the find of a lifetime. In the early 11th century, marauding Vikings terrorised southern England. Ethelred was the Anglo-Saxon ruler who attempted to buy peace, paying off the invading armies with sackloads of silver. It was a waste of money. Within a generation, England was ruled by a Danish king and the Viking conquest was complete. A thousand years later, in Buckinghamshire, an amateur metal detectorist made an astonishing discovery, including evidence of the desperation of the Anglo-Saxons in the face of the Viking threat. And luckily, he had a camera with him. In December 2014, Paul Coleman was taking part in an annual metal detectorist rally in Lenborough, and he was planning to call it a day. After an hour and a half, we got back to the same point we'd virtually started from and decided that with only one musket ball to show between three of us, that there wasn't a great deal in this field, or if there was, it was too deep for us to pick up. My friend's detector interferes with mine. Uh, uh, the radio frequencies are, are very close. Um, so I asked him if he would move over. He, says, he said his was fine, so I should move. So I did. I moved four or five yards away and walked immediately onto a large signal which turned out to be a really large signal. As Paul began to dig down, he saw something unmistakable. So as soon as I saw that shiny disc, I knew it was a coin. I also knew that it was potentially more than one because the signal was really large. So I, I just had an inkling that this was going to be something special. When I bent down to pick that one up and I saw the others, that's when I realised that this was a large hoard of coins. With the help of the Portable Antiquities Scheme, Paul uncovered a lead container overflowing with silver and gold coins. He could scarcely believe his eyes. It's a serious catch down there. He had one job. Yeah, one job. All he had to do was look after the half hour. I bet he had a bad day when he never bought these back. Straight away, they began to wonder where this huge fortune had come from. Then they spotted a clue, the name of a king. That looks like an aphorid. No, I don't know what it's called. Is it? Well, I, I, is that aphorid? It, but it says on there, you can't, you know. Yeah, I think it's aphorid. Ethelred was the English king from 978 AD to 1016. He was so desperate to end the Vikings' raids, he tried to pay them to go away. Ethelred's name is crucial to dating these coins to some time in his reign, a thousand years ago. It's getting to the bottom, isn't it? It's getting dark in here. We've got a lot of people. Yeah, that's, that's a light, mate. 
Be careful, because some of them are really brittle. Yeah. Light was fading. Under the guidance of an archaeologist from the Portable Antiquities Scheme, Paul and his friends worked quickly and carefully to rescue the treasure. But the stash seemed never ending. Oh. It's, a, it's a sad day when you run out of bags to put silver coins up. Especially when they're that busy. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we just leave the rest then? We haven't got any bags. You can afford yeah, we to. Have. We've got to <laughs> oh, we've got some more. Okay, okay. Just, okay. Uh, oh, fair enough. No. Just put less in. Okay. I'll email head office and see who's. Um, oh. See if they know where the coin guy is. They took the hoard back to the safety of a local farmer's kitchen and spent the rest of the night counting out their treasure. 5,252 silver coins, each one a millennium old, many in near mint condition, and priceless to historians. They were sent to the British Museum, where numismatist Gareth Williams began piecing together what this remarkable hoard could tell us about Britain a thousand years ago. Now he's brought along the most revealing specimens for us to look at in our lab. Well, Gareth, these coins are looking absolutely beautiful now that they've been cleaned up, and this is just a small sample of the collection. That's right, altogether over 5,000 coins, so one of the largest hordes of Anglo-Saxon coins ever discovered. And when do they date to? They date to the late Anglo-Saxon period, and we've got coins in here of two kings, Ethelred II, who ruled from 978 to 1016, and his successor, Knut, who ruled from 1016 to 1035. We've got the savings hoard of the earlier part and then a currency hoard coins withdrawn from what was current at the time of burial which is the last few years of Knut's reign so probably sometime in the 1030s. Can you pull out one of each ruler? Yes there? certainly. Here is Athelred II and here is Knut. Now these aren't portraits of either of them. Uh, coins of this period generally just imitate late Roman imperial designs, and both of these are just images of late Roman emperors with the king's name on. Canute was the Danish king determined to seize power in England and to establish Viking rule here. In desperation, King Ethelred resorted to throwing money at the problem, earning himself an unfortunate nickname. The English kingdom, had, which was more or less a, a, quite a new creation by the, by the 10th century, um, was under a lot of pressure by Viking raids from Viking armies increasingly during the reign of Ethelred. And we know Ethelred as Ethelred the Unready. The indication is that it's a contemporary uh, nickname. And the response to these Viking raids seems to be paying you know, greater quantities of, of money to um, Vikings quite simply to go away as well. And, and we know the Vikings don't go away. They see the English kingdom, which was very rich by this time, as a, as a great uh, source of, of wealth. The coins in this hoard reveal how desperate Ethelred became when faced with a full-scale Viking invasion. So Ethelred tried paying them to go away. That didn't work. He tried fighting them to drive them away. That didn't work. But he also tried a third method, and that's also represented in this hoard by a rather unusual type of coin. And you can see this doesn't have a royal image on it. Yeah, I can see this is a little lamb. He's carrying a cross under his arm. Um, he's, got a, he's got a halo as well, so we're yes, quite it's clear about lamb. it being a holy yeah. lamb. This seems to be part of a sort of coordinated year of prayer and increased piety in the year 1009. The point was that the Vikings were seen as God's judgment on the English for their ungodly behavior. And so the theory was, if the English became more godly, maybe God would reward them for that with support against the Vikings. So, and so this- literally reduced to praying for help. I yeah. Exactly. This new hoard reveals the last hope of a desperate king. Coins minted with Christian imagery in the hope that God would help him beat the Vikings. But Ethelred's piety was in vain. Canute seized power and the Viking conquest was complete. Finds like this have made it a remarkable year for archeology span in the east of England. And in London, one giant engineering project has offered an unparalleled opportunity to peel back the layers 
of the capital's history to reveal how the city first began to boom. Since Roman times, men and women have flocked to London, driving its population from 30,000 two millennia ago to 7 million today. And the capital is still growing. This is one of its newest and biggest developments. Crossrail, London's high-speed underground rail network. It's a massive piece of civil engineering. But it's also a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for archaeologists. The vast excavations are revealing what life was like for Londoners as the city mushroomed over two millennia. But what we're also discovering is the cost in human life. Liverpool Street Railway Station in the very heart of the city's buzzing financial district. Right outside the station, archaeologists from Crossrail and Museum of London Archaeology have uncovered clues to the brutal violence at the heart of Roman rule in Britain. on excavating this Roman road, which is a, a major Roman thoroughfare. Yeah, so what we've uncovered just in the last day is a number of skulls appearing in this area. They're actually mostly upside down, so they're not completely obvious. There's literally a line stretching from there, is the last one we found, all the way back to the end of the dig. The possibility is that these are beheading victims. Just a few days later, another remarkable burial shows more evidence of Roman execution. Yeah, OK. Yeah, we've just had a really interesting find down here at Liverpool Street. We're in the Eastern Ticket Hall excavation, and we've just found an intact burial that most likely dates to the Roman period. And the most interesting thing about it is you can probably see the skull has been detached and placed between the knees of this individual. There could be a number of different reasons. The first one, obviously, is an execution and beheading. We know that Rome ruled its empire with an iron fist. But can remains like these really be evidence of its rough justice in Britain? As an osteologist myself, I want to see the bones with my own eyes. So Don and Jay have brought one skeleton into our lab. It's interesting to have such explicit evidence of decapitation at this site, and I believe this skeleton shows decapitation again. Exactly. What we have here is uh, the remains of a male adult that we found in the cemetery, and what's very interesting to see is in the neck area, on the first thoracic vertebra, we have a very clear cut mark going through the skeleton. For example, this facet would normally fit on here, but it's been sliced off by a very sharp blade, and this cut has probably caused full decapitation of this individual. There's a, um, a polishing of the yeah. bone, isn't there, where the blade has come through here? So right at the base of somebody's neck. And do you think this would have been a, a blow coming in from the back, then? We believe so. It seems that for the blade to have come in and to have not affected the other spinous processes, it seems that yeah. the neck probably was flexed, in which case you'd suspect that the cut did come from, from the back. Yes. So by looking really carefully at the orientation of those cuts, you can reconstruct the grisly last moments of that person's life. Severed vertebrae. Decapitated skulls. It's chilling evidence of the brutal reality of Roman rule in Britain. These discoveries have been made thanks to Crossrail's massive excavations, but not all archaeology involves digging into the ground. In the Thames estuary, a team of divers is battling the elements to solve a maritime mystery. And they've sent us this dive diary. In 1665, Britain was gearing up for war with the Dutch, primarily to win back valuable trade routes to the New World. Among the Royal Navy's flagships was the London, a mighty gunship, 140 feet long and armed 
with 76 cannon. It's thought that on the 8th of March 1665, she was still crammed with guests, yet to disembark further down the river, when suddenly, in the mouth of the Thames, an explosion blew her to pieces. No one knows what caused that explosion, and to have any hope of solving the mystery, the first challenge is to rescue the London from the savage currents and ravenous wildlife of the Thames estuary before she's lost forever. In 2014, Cotswold Archaeology, Historic England and local South End residents launched a rescue mission. The team returned in the summer of 2015 when they recorded this footage. So this is day two and we're back out on the site of the London. Our main objective for this season, which is the excavation of the gun carriage. This was found at the end of um, last year and we just un sort of uncovered the very top of it. So the priority for this season is to continue excavating the gun carriage. We are, we're gonna commence dive operations um, now. Unfortunately, the wreck's location means that the London isn't going to give up her secrets easily. Well, as you can see here, we're right next to the main shipping channel uh, in and out of the Thames. So this is a very busy shipping lane. And some of the bigger ships are churning up the water, and we know that because when we're down there, visibility goes from OK to, to nothing and the noise kind of vibrates through your chest. But noise and poor visibility aren't the team's biggest problems. As turbulence from passing ships stirs up the sediment, it exposes the site to the destructive forces of nature. So you've got marine bore organisms like teredo and gribble that eat the wood and uh, that kind of just destroys it, and that can happen very quickly. So this is what's really important, the work that we're doing, and especially you know, recovering this gun carriage, because if that is, remains in situ as it is, it will not be there for very much longer. Despite these treacherous conditions, the team has recovered a wealth of finds, which show how the Thames silt can perfectly preserve the artefacts hidden beneath it. This looks really in really good condition. When I mean, you can see the grain, it doesn't look like it was used very much at the time either. No. There's not much in the way not of wear. Not much wear. Very nice. Yeah, nice. Well done, Steve. Some more recent finds. This is what I covered a few weeks ago. A little Sundown compass. To me, this would have been like a Rolex watch of a day. You would have had a sundial, a compass in there, match it up, that would have lifted up and they could get the dates of the time. Steve believes that this probably would have belonged to one of the higher-ranking crew members. You know, the chap who had this would be in a nice cabin, you know, far more comfortable than towards the, down towards the bilges. These are just a fraction of the objects recovered from the wreck so far. But time and tide wait for no man, so the team's focus soon returns to the star attraction. The gun carriage <laughs> is the main objective of this week and we've been progressively digging out that carriage and trying to uncover it as much as we can. Once we've uncovered it, the aim is to recover it. Working in such poor visibility, the team relies heavily on the underwater survey, which reveals much more detail about the location of the carriage within the wreck. So this, this line here, we think, is the bottom of the, you know, part, close to the bottom of the ship. And this kind of dark line here is where the carriages are, which looks like well, what we think is the, is the main gun deck, because that's what we think. We've got the side of the ship here lying on its side, because the carriages are pointing downwards rather than lying horizontal. And the fact that the gun carriages, or at least the one that we're excavating at the moment, has got all its associated gun furniture, tackle, kind of tells us that this object, this artifact, hasn't moved very far from its original position. Finally, on the very last day of the dive and after three and a half centuries lying on the seabed, the wooden gun carriage is rescued from the depths. We've finally recovered the gun carriage and that was a real effort. It was in a really awkward position. Uh, 
to try and get to the the bottom of it, it was you know trapped under many artifacts, very fragile artifacts. So we had to recover them carefully without destroying them. But eventually we've we've got it out and, and stropped it up and recovered it, and it was a great relief when it finally broke the surface. It was really amazing actually to think that that's been under the water for 350 years, and then suddenly it rises up. Weighing in at around a ton, this is the first complete gun carriage to be recovered from the London. It's just one of a wealth of clues rescued from the seabed. Some of which offer intriguing insights into the final moments on board the doomed ship. These finds were all made in a small area, suggesting that the London was jam-packed with supplies and ammunition. It sounds like the gunpowder was all together then in one place to cause such a massive explosion to rip this whole ship apart. The area that um, a lot of the materials come from is not much bigger than this table. And these are only a, a sort of a small selection of what we found. And yet we've got over 80 fragments of linstock, um, a huge number of hand spikes. And it's early days, but we, we would think that perhaps we've either got excess supplies on the ship um, or because it was fairly early in the voyage, perhaps they were putting everything out on deck to redistribute it between all the, the guns that were, were on the London. So the ammunition had yet to be safely stowed. But one find shows how the cannons would have been lit. An incredible achievement to get that gun carriage out of the water. But here we have some of the other artefacts as well. And what have we got here? We've got a selection of linstocks uh, that were used to uh, light the cannon from a safe distance. I'm intrigued by these items. Um, how do they work? They are turned wooden sticks, basically, and you would have um, a rope wrapped around these, which we call a slow match, and the end of it passes through this hole here and is slowly smouldering away at one end, right. and then you hold it at the end and like the cannon. And on this particular one, we've got um, some scorch marks, obviously real evidence to um, show that they have been used and have been scorched by the slow match that was around them. It seems then that the London was crammed with ammunition. And she may also have been crowded with guests who were yet to disembark downriver. But the archeologists also made further finds which hint at a possible cause of the terrible accident waiting to happen. These are quite personal items as well, really. These are little tobacco pipes, are they? Yeah. Tobacco pipes, though. I mean, this is the ship that was going out to war that obviously had cannon on board. You've got a ship that is packed full of gunpowder yeah. and you've got people smoking. I know. It's a bit of a recipe for disaster, really, isn't it? Um, I guess health and safety might have been a bit different 350 years ago, but um, with the crew members, you've got visitors on board, you've got over 300 barrels of gunpowder, naked flames from both the linstock and people smoking from the candles. They're going on the outward voyage um, and then something happened and it blew up. So we don't necessarily need to be looking for um, a suspicious reason for this explosion. It doesn't need to to have been arson um, or, or done with any intent. It could have purely been an accident. I think that's probably most likely. And I think a really important message as, as well, which is do not get on a warship full of gunpowder <laughs> and smoke. <laughs> yes. We may finally have a plausible theory to explain the London disaster. A flagship vessel fully loaded with gunpowder, a distracted crew and someone's disastrous mistake. The Museum of London Bone Store holds more evidence of the dangers of naval life. This man served in Nelson's Navy in the 1800s and lived to well over 50. But his skeleton tells us that his life at sea was brutal. Although obviously we're looking at him as a skeleton, he's dead, <laughs> what we're trying to do is look at the things that we can see on the bones to tell us what actually then may have happened in their life and how then they coped with it. And looking at his skeleton, he's remarkable because when we see lots of the things that we do, he obviously had a hard life and managed to survive lots of nasty insults and impacts. This collarbone has got a healed fracture in it. Now, that must, yes. that must have happened years before this individual died because it's, it's healed quite nicely, yep. although it has never regained its original shape. So these are the kind of fractures that you might sustain from a, a fall onto the shoulder. Are there any other injuries? 
Uh, there are. He's got um, some fractures to the ribs, again, all on, on one side. And they would appear to follow a similar pattern to the clavicle, so that might indicate that that's happening at the same time. Mm. It's the same mm. event. We've then also got the fracture of the femur, yes, then, where you yeah. can see there. So it does make you wonder if this all happened at the same time. It's all on the right-hand side of his body. Um, yes. These are the kinds of fractures that you might get, for instance, from falling from a height. What else, Helena, then? And he's also got a fracture to the first metacarpal, and then we've got the fracture also there on the, on the radius, the way you tend to sort of fall, you put your hand out. He's got a broken nose, yeah. <laughs> so you can sort of see there, you've again healed, but you've got that sort of deflection. Well, again, well, this is most likely not to have been caused by a fall, but actually <laughs> to have been caused by some, what do we, what, how do we say, interpersonal, interpersonal aggression, aggression, being yes. punched in the face. Yes. With the vertebra that you can see here, they're all very frilly. They, mm. they shouldn't mm. look like that. And then you can see where you've actually got some crushing uh, of the vertebra. So if we come there to, oh, to yes, that one... That's, that's lost a lot of height. So a thoracic vertebra, a vertebra from the back of the chest, there's a fairly normal-looking vertebra. Yes. <laughs> and there's the one that suffered this a rather thin, yes. wedge fracture. Yes. So that's been completely squashed, reduced in height. So he's got a whole suite of, of changes that, that you would be looking at, but also then you're thinking of the consequences and impact of how he would be able to function in a daily life, but also how he was functioning while he was still at sea, and then also later on in older age, the you know potential pain, discomfort that you might have from these. It's phenomenal when you're looking at the skeleton and you can see so many things that have affected them in mm. life but the fact that they actually were able to survive. And particularly when we think at the times in which they lived, they wouldn't have had all of the things to help them that we do now. So that's even more amazing that they've actually uh, survived, really. So they, were, they really were hardy and tough. <laughs> the London set sail in 1656, just as our Navy began to assert its will across the world. Within 200 years, Britannia ruled the waves. Sailors like this man made that possible, and he was left with the scars. But in the mid-20th century, the tables turned, and Britain was on the back foot as it desperately defended itself against savage attacks by Hitler's Luftwaffe. But one thing remained the same. Britons put themselves on the line for their country. Our next dig takes us to West Sussex, where archaeologists are shining a new light on a story we think we know so well, the Battle of Britain. But their new discovery reveals forgotten heroes, a machine and a pilot. In the summer of 1940, waves of German Luftwaffe filled our skies. Hitler's plan crushed the smaller RAF and then launch a full-scale invasion. Standing in his way, the iconic Spitfires and their daring British pilots. But a dig on this hillside is reminding us that Spitfires didn't win the Battle of Britain on their own, and that our British pilots weren't the only heroes. We are excavating the remains of a hurricane shot down in the Battle of Britain on the 9th of September, 1940. Hawker Hurricanes actually shot down 50% more enemy planes than did Spitfires. Yet, it's the Spitfire whose name has become iconic. The Hurricane was, if you like, the, the forgotten hero of the Battle of Britain. I mean, it's not forgotten, but it, it didn't get all the glamour of the, of the Spitfire. Unfortunately, this Hurricane never made it back to base. This is the impact crater. It's slightly ovaled. It's where the aircraft's come down and hit. Then the, the, obviously the weight of the aircraft is, is displaced all the earth and the chalk. We've had pistons and valves and bits of engine casing. So now we've cleaned it up, we can see where it is. We can now proceed to go down and see what else is there. Amongst the finds recovered is evidence of the sheer violence of the impact. 
This is part of the ammunition box that contained the 303 rounds for one of the machine guns. It's just a, a thin aluminium box. But when the aircraft crashed, there was, there was a lot of ammunition um, on it. And what happened was the, the force pushed all the ammunition down into the box. And we can actually see here, this is one of the bullets, um, it's actually punched its way through the box and made a very neat little hole there. So that was a, that's, a, that's a cracking find. 75 years to the day after the crash, one of the larger pieces is discovered, part of the propeller assembly from the nose of the plane, and it has survived intact. This is where the propeller blade would go, so the propeller blade would be sticking out here, and that would be rotating, and there'll be another one about here, and another one about here. Yeah. So you've got the three blades, rotor hub. Here to help with the heavy lifting is a group from Operation Nightingale, an initiative to rehabilitate British soldiers recently returned from active service. The team today is largely composed of military veterans. Excitingly for us, we've got three um, Polish soldiers that have served in Afghanistan, and they're working alongside British veterans, people who've fought in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, but also people who served in Northern Ireland and indeed in the Falklands campaign. For these Polish veterans, this is a chance to celebrate the other unsung heroes of the story, the Polish pilots who fought for the Allies in squadrons like the 303. This is great for me because a uh, pilot with the Division 303 is a uh, Polish, Polish heroes, Polish flying hero, heroes. And Sergeant Lynch, this is great, great pilot with the, the squadron. 303 Squadron was a predominantly Polish unit and it became the most successful in the Battle of Britain, shooting down 108 German planes in a single month. The Polish pilots, they were almost, if you like, the forgotten heroes of the Battle of Britain. They were relatively small in number, and what they did, just like the Hurricane really, was disproportionate to their, to their numbers, but they achieved an incredibly high kill score. Their determination to get at the enemy was second to none for obvious reasons. Their country had been invaded, so consequently their kill rate of, of uh, enemy aircraft destroyed was significantly higher than any other squadron. 21-year-old Kazimir Wunsch was a sergeant in 303 Squadron when his hurricane was shot down on the 9th of September 1940. Luckily, he managed to parachute to safety, and as the presence here of his daughter and granddaughter testifies, he lived to tell the tale. He was slightly injured. He, the oil blew into his face, so he had some burns, and he had uh, was something injured in his leg and in his back. But after staying in Hove Hospital for a month, he went back to flying, and he was flying until the end of the war. My grandfather died when I was six months old, so I never got to really know him. And I'm amazed that we found this plane. The last person to see it intact before it went into the ground was my grandfather, and that means a lot to me. There's a, there's a piece, I think, I'll remember it to the end of my days, it's the Morse panel. He would have touched that, he would have looked at that on a daily basis every time he got into the plane. If his radio had gone down, that might have saved his life. And so to see the words Morse and all the other bits on that piece is just incredible and it, it, it does make me feel a real connection with him. The 75th anniversary of the crash is marked by a rare sight, a fly past by a fully restored, original World War II hurricane. It got really quiet. Yeah. <laughs> now, what are you actually hoping to discover by undertaking an excavation like this? Because we know that hurricanes were used in the war, we know that hurricanes went down in the war, and in fact, we know that this actual hurricane went down in the war. So, so what other information are you hoping to glean? This really is not going to change the story of the Battle of Britain, clearly. However, you can get little vignettes from it, and um, it's the personal stories occasionally. You get bits of um, kits from the pilot. Um, the ammunition will also tell you a story about that particular day in September 1940, in the hope that this aircraft was going to bring down some of those um, attacking aircraft. I think that's really important to remember that the, the Poles played a, a very big role, but there were pilots from Czechoslovakia as was, um, French pilots, a couple of Americans, South Africans, Australians, people from all around the world contributing to this, this global effort to, to stop the, this hideous entity from being able to invade. And so this artefact, although it is just a bullet, it's way more than that, because this has got a narrative of those days in 1940 and, you know, a critical part of, of, of our, our island's history, really. What do you think it was about the Polish pilots that, that, that gave them such a good kill rate? 
I think there's almost a visceral hatred that goes on with the Polish pilots. We, we've been talking about the defending of, of Britain with the Battle of Britain. Now, the Poles didn't have that luxury. In, 19, in, in 1939, their country had been invaded. It's the reason, ostensibly, Britain goes to war. And so they are fighting to try and liberate their country. And the only way they can do it at that time is to fight back at the Luftwaffe. And so they are a determined bunch. They're, they're a group with anger. They are a, a group that perform incredibly well. And despite this plane crashing, of course, Wuncher himself escapes. And as we saw, that. his daughter and his granddaughter in the film, and I think the archaeology was very important to them. It was, and, and to be able to, to have that hands-on for your family tree, um, that's a, a physical manifestation of your heritage, which is, which is really, really powerful. Um, so you're able to put your, your fingers where your, your grandfather or your father had, had put his in, in the cockpit, or, or to look through a piece of perspex, a bit of glass. So you're looking through that same, um, same viewing screen that, that your, your relative had. And that, that's a really strange feeling in archaeology, to be able to have that direct connection with people from the past. This dig has helped a family connect with their war hero from a brave generation and reminds us all about the foreign pilots who risked everything to save Britain. It reveals the power archaeology has to tell our stories, whatever the era, from a bloody battle fought in our skies in 1940 to the brutal oppression of Roman rule. While from the silt of the Thames and from a trench in Waterloo, new clues have helped to solve age-old mysteries, to reveal not only what came before us, but to show how our past still shapes who we are today.